Hello, everyone. Thank you for all uh, for having me tonight. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. So I will start talking about the sky this month. My name is Claudio and speaking from Richmond Hill, uh, just north of Toronto, a few hundred meters away from the David Dallop Observatory. At Glimpse, what's going on this month? So we have a few planetary close encounters. Venus and Jupiter will be only half degree apart tonight and tomorrow. They will be just one degree apart. Jupiter will be half degree north of the moon on March 20. And Venus and the moon will be only 0 0.1 degree apart on March 24. So full moon is going to be on March 7. Don't forget uh, to advance your clocks by one hour on uh, March 12. So we have 
to change our clock because daylight savings and also best time of the year to watch the zodiacal light in the northern hemisphere after sunset for about two weeks starting march 9th we are going to have spring equinox on march 20 and a new moon and a cirrus at the position on march 21st it's galaxy season exciting time and i will talk about uh, something about best year marathon opportunity no major meteor showers in march but let's start tonight now look at the west if your sky is clear this picture i took uh, one hour ago venus and jupiter in conjunction now less than one degree apart what does it mean it means that if you stretch your arm and put your pinky like this you will cover both the planets zodiacal light the time of the equinox is one of the best times of the year to see the zodiacal light why because uh, it's the time of the year while uh, the zodiacal light is uh, the steepest angle and uh, what is a zodiacal light by the way it's a triangular diffuse glob of light made of interplanetary dust and is on the same plane of the ecliptic where the planets look moving from the northern hemisphere you will be able to see the zodiacal light after sunset around the equinoxes and it's interesting because this is uh, a recent discovery new research uh, by the sun um, the spacecraft juno suggests that the interplanetary dust that causes the phenomenon may have martian origin more in the next slide but you can also see the link here this is something I found on the internet. And it's interesting that the Juno spacecraft has a 60 square meters of solar arrays provide a large target for dust impacts. And what they noticed is that they recorded more than 15,000 events while it was around Mars. This is the um, research. Sunrise, sunset. So on March 1st tonight, the sunrise was at 6.54 a.m. and sunset was at 6.05 p.m. So almost 11 hours and 11 minutes of daylight. But April 5th, we have more light than night. So this is good news, maybe not for astronomers, but this is something to um, keep in mind when you have to plan your observations. And again, the astronomical twilight today, the twilight ends at 7.41 p.m. and starts at 5.19 a.m. So this means that we have a nine hour and 38 minutes of imaging light. Spring equinox will be on March 20, as I said before. And on April 5th, you will see that we have only eight hours and 12 minutes of imaging light. So we need means that we lost one hour, 26 minutes of imaging time since March the 1st. The sky. So first of all, we have to get ready to say goodbye to Rai on the winter constellations for the next few weeks. They're still in a decent position, so take advantage. Andromeda sets to the west horizon around midnight tonight, and the spring constellation is starting getting higher in the eastern sky. So Leo, Virgo, Coma, Berenices, Botes, Corona Borealis, and so on. And at the end of March, Libra, Serpents of Hugos, and Scorpio will appear. And uh, galaxy season. So if you see the sky tonight at 9.30 to the south, southwestern sky, you can see Orion still in a decent position, as I said. And Sirius, the Canis Major. The Taurus is here, Aldebaran. And if you move, this is from Stellarium, by the way, if you move to the southeast east horizon, you can see that the spring constellation will getting higher and higher. Leo, Coma, Berenice, Virgo, with a galaxy cluster. Looking north, you see that the Big Dipper, will be higher in the sky as well and also Ursa Major. Cepheus is going lower and Cassiopeia and Andromeda will be very, very low. While if you look 
to the west horizon, you will see that also the Taurus is going down. You can see Mars is still in the Taurus constellation. And let's talk about the planets and let's start with our sun. The sun is approaching its maximum activity for this solar cycle. And uh, if you check the links below, we had northern lights uh, two days ago and uh, three days ago, I got a notification on my aurora forecast. Someone a kilometer from here was able to see the aurora. I went out, I was already wearing my PJ, but I wasn't as lucky. But keep an eye, there are lots of, uh, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of uh, um, sunspots. You can see this is a picture I took uh, a couple of weeks ago with a solar filter. The moon uh, reached apogee on March the 3rd, where its distance will be 400,000 kilometers, while the perigee for this month will be on March 19th and its distance will be 362,000 kilometers. The phases of the moon, so we see that the full moon, the next full moon will be on March 7th at 7.40 a.m. Eastern time, while last quarter will be on March 14th, it will be uh, already Easter daylight time saving. So. Keep an eye on your watch. The new moon will be on March 21st and the first quarter will be on March 28th. Lot of activities. The moon, the planets will be interesting this month. So tonight, as I already said, that there is a spectacular conjunction between Venus and Jupiter, only 0.5 degree apart. And tomorrow is still a good day if you have a good uh, weather because uh, the planets will be only one degree apart, still very close. And then what happens next is that Jupiter will go down and Venus will be higher in the sky. On March 22nd, Jupiter will be positioned half degree above the moon and moon and Venus will be very interesting to see on March 24th because they will be only 0 0.1 degrees apart. Moon and Mars will uh, kiss each other on March 28th. And this is very hard to see on March 31st, Venus and Uranus will be only 1.3 degrees apart. But there's a problem because is uh, uh, after sunset, Venus will be very easy to find, but Uranus will be only 5.8 magnitude. So more than 4,000 times dimmer. Good luck and let me know if you can see them. So this is the situation for Jupiter and Venus tonight. And if you scroll to the next slide, this is tomorrow. So you will see Jupiter to the left is going down and Venus is going higher on the Western horizon. On March 21st, the asteroid one series will be at opposition. It's a very good chance to see this uh, uh, asteroid because its values will be plus 7.32. So it's easy to find if you know where to look. It will be um, in Leo constellation. And then on March 22nd, you will see that the moon meets Jupiter. So very low in the sky again on the Western horizon after sunset. This is uh, around eight o'clock PM. On March 24, again, the moon meets Venus and very low to the horizon, hard to see, Jupiter and uh, somehow here there is Mercury. Again, as I said before, March or Uranus on March 24 will be very close, but try to look at them. A uh, good uh, photo ops will be on March 25th because the moon and uh, the Pleiades will share the same field of view. While on March 28th, the moon meets Mars. Other uh, things that are notable, Mars and M35 will be very close together. So it's another um, good opportunity to take a picture 
because uh, this uh, open cluster in Gemini shared the same field of view at the moon, of Mars, sorry. And Venus and Uranus on March 30, 31st, with a binocular, a camera, a small telescope, maybe you can have a chance to see them together. Very hard to see, but why don't you try? Mercury will be invisible in the next few days because it will reach a superior conjunction on March 17. It will be on the opposite side of the sun and it will return in the evening sky in the last few days of March. In April, will we have the best evening apparition of the year for the Northern Hemisphere, so keep ready to watch Mercury. Venus, you can't have any, any mistake because after sunset, this is the very prominent object in the Western evening sky. And it will be um, 85.6 illuminated at the beginning of this month, while the part that is illuminated is at 75% at April 5th. It's like a moon, it's a, a elongator here, and this is what you can see from Stellarium. And again, it will be an extremely close uh, conjunction tonight and tomorrow night with Jupiter. So if you didn't go out and have a look and if you have a good weather, because it's very, very nice to see. And also extremely a close encounter with the waxing crescent moon on March 24th. And again, with Uranus on March 30th and 31st. Mars is still very well placed in the Venus sky in Taurus constellation, and uh, the first quarter moon will pass two degrees north of Mars on March 28th. So sign the date. Jupiter will be very low to the horizon, so we have the last few weeks to look at Jupiter before uh, we say goodbye. Saturn will emerge in the morning twilight on the second half of March. And the ring season is closing. The next ring plan crossing will be on 2025. Uranus, you have still a few weeks to see at Uranus before is going on conjunction. And Venus will be very close to Uranus on March 21st. Neptune, no chance to see Neptune. Comet and asteroid. So as I say, the series will reach opposition on March 21st. And by the way, if you want to look uh, to see more about comets, uh, there is this website that is uh, um, telling you about the brilliant, the bright comets. I only um, took notes of comets that will reach a magnitude that is uh, less than 11. We still talk about the comet CDF still bright enough. Uh, it was a 7.7 .7 on February 26. It is still observable in the northern hemisphere until the end of April. Uh, there is another comet that was 8.2 magnitude on February 21st, but is not visible on the northern hemisphere, unfortunately, until this summer. While there is this comet, the C2022A2 Pan Stars, that is visible in our latitude, but very low in the sky. So it's a little bit challenging. And this comet, ZDF uh, C2020 V2, was a 10.6 magnitude of February 23rd. So in order to watch all these comets, you will need a binocular or a small telescope. But above all, you need to know where to find them. And um, recently, I created a video tutorial on how to add the minor planets, so comets and asteroids, to Stellarium. And this is the link. Deep sky suggestions for March. So we still have some nebula, as I said, M42, the Great Orion Nebula here. Open clusters, the Pleiades, are still visible quite high in the sky for a few weeks still. And you have a good chance to see beautiful open clusters in Gemini and Auriga. So M35, M36, M37, and M38. Galaxies, M81 and M82 in Orsa Major are getting higher and higher. 
by the end of March, beginning of April, that will be the best time of the year to watch them. MTP1, the Whirlpool Galaxy, is also visible, and also the, Whir the Pinwheel Galaxy, M101 in Northa Major. I didn't mention NGC object because this month I want to um, focus on something that uh, we can try at the end of March, the Messier Marathon, in the next few slides. The challenge for this month. First, get the right equipment. Unfortunately, we'll need at least a binocular or a small telescope to see all the objects of the Messier Marathon, at least, uh, I would say, an 80 millimeter diameter telescope under darker sky. If you have a go-to mount, probably it's preferred, but you can also try to hop if you know where to look. Find the right location, and it's very important to have a dark sky, if you can, with a little light pollution and if possible with no moon interference because there are some messier objects that are very low to the horizon so you have you need to have a, a clear sky of the horizon pick the right date so all the 110 messier objects will pass through the night sky only on certain night of the year usually february march and September, depending on your latitude. In 2023, the new moon will be on March 21st. So pick a date, maybe during the weekend, before or after. So I said March 18, March 19, or March 25th, March 26th. Mark your calendar. This is a resource I found, spacetourismguide.com slash Messier uh, minus marathon. And this is where I found this information. Use a resource to guide the marathon route. It's nice to have some other amateur astronomer to look together with because that is more fun. Uh, by the way, is anyone planning to do a Messier marathon this year? Just let me know in the comments. And read the ultimate guide to the Messier marathon. So the observing guide to the Messier marathon and handbook to Atlas. This is a very, very good book. And most important, there is an optimal order to succeed in a Messier Marathon. And this uh, I will go through very quickly, but uh, um, you can see the link here, the next page, and messier.seeds.com slash extra slash marathon slash marath1.html. This is the list, it's a long list. I don't want to go through. Maybe I can just let you see where to start and where you to end, because this will take you the entire night. So we'll start in situ Pisces, uh, Triangulum, Andromeda, so on the western horizon, Castiopeia, Perseus, Taurus. And then you go south, Orion, uh, Seal, Taurus, Gemini, Ariga, Canis Major, Opis Monoceros. If you look at the map, you're going from west to south, And then there is a long, long list going um, deep in the night. You will see galaxies in Leo, Ursa Major, Canis Venatesi, again, Ursa Major, Draco, Coma Berenices. So if after midnight, Virgo, one o'clock in the morning, Coma Berenices, Virgo, two o'clock in the morning. And then you start looking at the, the Summer constellation, serpents, the snake, Hercules, Lyra, Cygnus, the little fox, Dulpecula, the dumbbell nebula, and then going down in Scorpius or Fucus, uh, and then Sagittarius uh, is very busy here, and then Pegasus going back almost uh, um, sunrise. So Keep going faster and faster, Aquarius and Capricornus. And then that's it. And please let me know if you reach. I didn't finish a Messier Marathon, but it is my bucket list. About ISS visible passes, we have a few of them. This is the link to find them. So www.heavensabove.com. 
and uh, you will need to specify your um, coordinates, latitude, and longitude for your location, and you will see. The brightest, the number, so minus 2.8 is a good chance, and minus 2.4 is a good chance, and so 3. minus 3.5 is very, very bright. So if you look from March the 1st to April and see where this is possible. If you click to the links here to the left, you will reach a map when you can see where the International Space Station is visible. We have a few events. If you see minus 3.9, it's uh, 5 in the morning, but if you're awake, maybe you can try to look. And then uh, at some point, you will see March 14, uh, the International Space Station will uh, switch from the morning sky to the evening sky after sunset. See 10 o'clock on March 15. And uh, March 16 is a very good chance. And March 17 are the best for this month because you see minus 3.4, minus 3.8, almost the same magnitude as Venus. So save the date here again. And again, at the end of March, we have a few more options still in the evening sky. Even on March 30, March 31st, very bright, minus 3.8, minus 3.7, and so on. Every once in a while, you should look at this website again because, uh, you know, these dates are valid for today. But, you know, if there is a new spacecraft that is uh, docking to the International Space Station and their maneuver, this will change over the time. So you have to check probably for the next week is more accurate. For the next three weeks, probably, you want to go back to be sure that uh, you have the same time. And then let's talk about space exploration. Uh, there are a few events happening this month. I don't want to go through all of them, but um, probably the most interesting will be the Crucic mission has been uh, delayed a couple of times. SpaceX mission, um, beginning this will be February 19, then February 26, and then February 27, delay, delay, delay. So the next uh, possible date is March the 2nd. As a backup, they have March the 3rd. And we have a lot of uh, satellites, sorry about that. One web, Starlink, It's X, but the most interesting for me, I don't know if this will be real, but there was an announcement a few weeks ago, maybe the Starship will have the first orbital test flight. I don't know yet, but keep an eye on the website, the SpaceX and the space.com, there was the announcement. So maybe that will be the first orbital test flight. It should have been on uh, the 2022nd, but then it was delayed. And uh, the last new, the latest news say that probably it will be at some point in March or maybe April. So keep an eye on this. Starlink again and space exploration. So this is a website where I found the most of the space uh, um, launch. And uh, that's pretty much it for me. I don't know if you have any questions.
Oh, uh, I think I got a question. I don't know if you can hear me. So we will reach the maximum this solar cycle next year, but the sun is very active. So keep an eye whenever you can, but with the solar filter, please. Oh, yes, sorry. We do have questions from online. Um, the first question is, um, Claudio, do you have a website where you keep your images and uh, equipment? Yes, I do. Uh, my website is uh, wondersofthesky.com. Great. Um, there was another question. Um, have the Japanese Space Agency said what went wrong for them? Oh, I didn't notice that. I don't know. I had to check online, but yes, I think a, a few weeks ago there was someone, uh, a speaker that was a very, uh, was a, even crying, I think, but I don't remember exactly. So there were there was a problem with the spacecraft. If okay. this is what you were talking about, and so uh, I was yes. feeling very bad for the speaker. They left him alone. Cool. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for the questions from online. Um, back to you, Paul. All right. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed those fun facts uh, in the uh, remote audience. Uh, my name is Dennis Gray, as Paul mentioned, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about a uh, new mount uh, that's recently become available. I would say within the past uh, six months or so, it's been on the market. Um, and it's part of a sort of a, a wave of new, um, uh, a very new type of mount, um, which also has incorporated into it uh, uh, a fundamentally new way of actually working with the mount, which is app-based control. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and uh, I'll have a little demo for people in the audience, and we may be able to put a camera on that as well. And we'll see how it uh, goes from here. So let's start. Um, so first of all, I, I mentioned in my title there that it's a harmonic drive. What is a harmonic drive? We know that it lives in harmony and it is happy, but what else about it is that makes it special? And then I'll talk about this particular instance here, which is the AM5, which is done by ZWO. We'll talk about its different uh, operating modes, a little bit about how it tracks and so forth, and we'll hopefully have some time for questions and answers as we go along. So, Question number one, what is a harmonic drive? Um, so when we think about mounts, <clears throat> a lot of uh, emphasis goes into their weight carrying capacity and how, how well they work and so forth. But one of the key considerations is tracking. And um, the tracking is normally a function of the gearing. And, and so the gearing and the quality of the gearing, the material that the gears are made of, these things are important. So for example, um, a traditional, um, low end telescope would have um, brass gears or maybe, you know, sort of mystery metal gears. Um, and there would be a, a potential for a lot of slop. And essentially that slop that happens is that that gap between the various parts of the gears that, um, you know, essentially is a bit of dead space so that when you try to reverse the direction of your uh, telescope, then uh, there's a pause or a, a backlash that uh, has to be managed. And then the, the other thing, of course, is the tracking. So every time there's, there's a, a point where the teeth of the gear mesh together, um, each one of these points here, there's a, a point where you can introduce slop. And if the gears aren't perfectly mis machined and no gear is perfectly machined, you'll have tracking errors and so forth. So this has been the bane of astronomers existence pretty well since the equatorial mount was invented in 1843 and ever since then we've been we've been talking about this and dealing with it so that's our traditional design with a, a worm gear driving the telescope on its axis and and that's a key part of it now a harmonic drive and this is from I, I didn't know what this was so I looked it up on the internet so it's uh, it's a type of a mechanical gear system that uses the what's called a flexible spline 
the spline, which is like splaining things, but not, it's a spline. But this flexible uh, red piece here, um, and it's deformed by a, a rotating elliptical uh, piece that's in the middle. And it's that red thing then drives the blue thing around um, to get the motion you're looking for. But what's interesting about this is you notice when it's going around and around in a circle here, at no point when it's pushing are those, is there any spacing in those gears at all? Those gears are absolutely tight to one another by design. So there's uh, from complete engagement. They're really, really focused on each other. They're properly engaged. And it's been around for a while. It was patented in 1957, this concept. It was used on Skylab and it was driving the lunar rovers around in the 60s. So, so it's been around for a while, but now it's come to telescope uh, uh, life. So why is this um, <clears throat> a cool new thing? Why are people excited about this? Well, first of all, because of that spline drive or that harmonic drive piece, there's absolutely no backlash whatsoever, which is really nice. So you change direction uh, with your, your scope, you stop, you go back the other way, it stops and it goes back the other way right away. There's no, ah, I'm gonna think about it. Yeah, you've convinced me, I'm gonna go back now. Uh, which is the way that my telescopes normally work, right? Um, the other thing about it is that that entire gearbox is in one area here. So looking at the uh, scope that we have in front of us there, you can see how small and compact that mount is. The entire gearing system and everything is in those little boxes there on the bottom and on the, uh, the side there. Um, the other thing about it is that with this engagement of these gears in the spline drive, it can handle a lot more torque. So this gives the mount a high payload capacity relative to um, other designs without necessarily having to add a lot of weight. So as long as you make the, the harmonic drive out of quality materials to start with, it's got enough teeth and enough traction on it that it doesn't have any trouble pushing things around. And then the final point, which is <clears throat> I thought was pretty cool, coaxial input and output shafts. Doesn't everyone want to have one of those at home, right? I'm talking, yep. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Richard. You want a coaxial input and output shaft, don't you? But I, I think what it means, and I'm guessing here because I really don't know what it means, but um, what it means is that um, when you look at a traditional gearing system, you kind of have a gear that's this way and a gear that's that way and another gear that's that way. And that actually creates more work for the gearing system to do. But the, uh, the way that the spline drive works is essentially everything's in one direction. So the motor is turning in the same direction as the mount is turning. So there's a direct drive kind of thing going on there. I think that's what that means, but it sure sounds good. And I'm glad, I'm glad I got one of those. So one of the things that uh, comes to mind first when you have it, so these are all the advantages and this is why you would consider buying one of these things. Um, so some of the things that changed, I noticed right away is that, um, this drive is always engaged. It's always, it's, it's not always plugged in. It's not always moving, but it's always engaged. So there's no clutches. You will not find any clutches on this. So if you want to move the mount in any direction whatsoever, you will need to do it electronically. So you will have to, uh, use your hand controller or use the app or whatever to do it. So this means that because there's no clutches, if you do have a heavy payload, you can't do what we normally would do to balance a telescope. So normally what you do is you put the telescope on, you put the counterweights on the telescope, you loosen the clutches, and then you try and get it so that it's uh, pretty well balanced, a little bit of extra weight towards against the flow of the tracking, and that's how um, you set up your telescope. That's sort of optimal. But in this case, um, you really need to balance your scope off, off the scope if you want to do that, but it's not as critical now as it would be with an equatorial mount. So you can get away with a little less um, uh, finesse and a little less uh, fine tuning on the balance because of the nature of the mount. So what I've done in my case is uh, simply done a little clutchless balancing. So essentially I put my um, uh, telescope together. So there's my camera, there's my guider, there's my uh, lens and everything. And I just put a roller pin underneath the mount of the scope and make sure that um, it's roughly balanced uh, before I uh, put it on the scope. So I'm making a note of here's roughly where my balance point is. 
and then I put it on the scope there and away it goes. So a uh, little bit of a different approach compared to what you might be used to working with an equatorial map. So let's look at this particular um, version of this. So this is called the AM5. I don't know what happened to AMs one and one through four. It's a little bit like a, a famous science fiction series I much know and love, um, but I'm assuming that they were not entirely successful. Um, so it's lightweight, go to, very um, astrophotography focused, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, and it works with um, uh, ZWO's ASI Air Suite. Um, the advertised performance specs up to 13 kilograms with no counterweight and up to 20 with a counterweight. So um, on the front of the uh, scope, you'll see the little silver counterweight bar comes down. That's an optional thing. You actually have to pay extra to get a counterweight bar uh, included in the scope. And there are no weights sold with the mount itself. You can use other people's weights. This is actually a uh, counterweight extension bar from an NEQ6 mount, which happens to work in the same hole. Um, the uh, mount is sold or with a recommended carbon fiber tripod, which uh, fits nicely into the mount. Um, or it also takes a standard heavy duty 3 8 inch photography socket. Um, so you, I'm using this with an actual non-standard tripod. This is a tripod I had from another application and it's just uh, uh, screwed in with, the, uh, with that to give us the connection to the tripod, which is very important. There are other versions of this same kind of mount on the market or nearly on the market. So Ioptron has a version called an HEM27. Um, it's a similar size, at, at least it looks like a similar size from what I can tell in the ads and so forth. Uh, price point is about the same. One key difference is that the harmonic drive piece is only on the one axis. So it's only on the axis that's tracking the stars. The uh, declination axis, which is uh, pointing it in other directions, is a standard geared kind of configuration. So uh, they've taken a little bit of a different approach there uh, compared to this one. Um, and they have a, um, uh, an encoder option available. And what that means is they have a high precision or high, um, high, high heavy duty tracking option that you can pay extra for. Uh, Pegasus Astro, which makes a line of interesting and useful Astro sex accessories, has uh, been working on an NYX 101. I was following this. I was interested in buying this before I settled on the AM5. Um, they were having troubles getting it right out the door. They had boxes ready. They had tripods ready. They had um, tests ready. They had videos of them doing tests. All kinds of action, not very much product in Canada. So I ended up going um, with this one. It has a slightly smaller load capacity, but it has a lot of the same advantages uh, that we are talking about here with the AM5. One of the biggest changes with this mount that you'll see uh, immediately is it its hand controller is very, very simple. Um, most um, telescopes that we're looking at, they have a lot of complex functions on the hand control. The hand controller's got smarts. There's a little uh, chip in there, there's a little mini computer. Uh, you're putting in your uh, alignment process, you're uh, using the go-to functions, you're adjusting your tracking, all of that stuff is done through the hand paddle. And uh, there's various versions of the hand paddle depending on the model you're choosing. <clears throat> the M5 has basically said, you know, we're not in the hand controller business at all. We are put, there's an app for that. We're moving all of that complexity over to an app. And so what we are left with then is a really simple hand control. So there's a button you can press to go fast or slow. Um, you can turn the tracking on or off and you can park it or stop it. And that's it. And it's, I'm just gonna. This is for the benefit of the studio audience. I'm going to demonstrate that yes, in fact, it works. So if I pick uh, the high speed mode, I can move that mount around. It moves up to six degrees per second, which is six times the width of the full moon. So as we go uh, back and forth, uh, we can slew the mount fairly quickly and get to our 
our area. One of the things I like about this is it has its uh, homing function. So there's a hardware home function. And if I hold down a button and I tell it it's time for a good night, I'm going to be able to bring it back and set it to uh, go back to its home position right away. So, the other thing I think that the studio audience can attest to is it's pretty quiet. How many people heard that in the back? Ralph, you weren't supposed to hear it. <laughs> but I think compared to some of the earlier go-to mo models, I'm thinking particularly the early LX200s, uh, people said, yep, that's a coffee grinder. No, it's a telescope. No, it's a coffee grinder. Anyway, so we had to, we had to think about what it is. So there are, there's more than one way to control this. And of course, the one that I think if you're thinking of buying this as a, just as a, as a mount, the one you're going to be interested in is the ASCOM um, mode, which is basically just saying, I want to use this with my ASCOM driver uh, and connect it to my standard telescope setup. I just want to plug it into my old existing environment. They say they're working on an Indie version. Uh, Indie is the alternative Mac friendly um, standard for interoperability of astronomical equipment. Uh, not yet available, but they're think they say they're working on it. And then, um, there is the uh, ZWO apps we'll have a look at in a sec. Um, one thing I should mention for people is that the mount is easily converted from equatorial mode to um, alt azimuth mode. For people who have, don't know what that means exactly, alt azimuth means for visual observing, it's much easier because your eyepiece tends to stay at the same height and roughly in the same location. You notice uh, when we're tracking against the, the pole, your telescope can sometimes end up in awkward, more awkward positions, but it's better for photography. So the fact that you can actually switch between the two modes easily is really kind of nice. Um, and it's kind of almost like uh, you're getting two mounts in one and it's become an increasingly uh, popular option. I know Skywatcher offers that and other, other uh, vendors offer that as well. So the ASCOM mode is pretty much the standard place you would start. Uh, the ASCOM driver is downloaded from uh, the uh, manufacturer's website. Uh, you can change it to alt azimuth by adjusting the mount. So when you, what you would do if you want to switch to alt azimuth mode is you change it orientation wise to put it like 90 degrees up. And then the mount senses that it has been set to alt azimuth mode and then uh, performs accordingly. But let's just have a look at how this works in ASCOM mode. Here, so I'm going to do a little demonstration from pre-recorded from an earlier weekend. So this video will just give a quick demonstration of what it's like to work with the AM5 using its ASCOM driver without any additional add-on from the ASI Air um, uh, mini computer that goes with the scope. So the first thing we'll do is we'll connect the, uh, the mount to the uh, software here. So we're using the sky. And uh, when it's connected, the default position is Polaris. That's the home position set for this mount. Um, so I can see here I've got a basic uh, sort of um, virtual hand paddle that I'm able to work with here. So I can uh, smooth them out in a different direction here. And I can see it move uh, relative to, uh, to the, uh, the item here. Uh, there's a firmware update feature which allows you to go if you're connected to the internet and check to see if you have a, uh, any firmware that will improve the mount. Um, currently, I'm up to date on that, so there's nothing to do there, but it's supposed to be automatic when it runs. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, essentially the behavior of the mount itself, um, I can turn on uh, sidereal tracking right away from here, and there's some advanced settings where I can uh, read mount settings so I can see here where the mount thinks it's pointing in terms of altitude, azimuth, RA, RA and declination, uh, the current sidereal time, and what side of the pier the mount is on. So all of these are pretty standard settings. And I'm able to sync my location information and time information to the mount from, from the computer uh, using this little utility here. But for the most part, you're not even going to be using that. You're simply going to uh, dismiss it and then you'll be using it as a go-to mount. So if you pick something like Jupiter, uh, which is in the other uh, hemisphere here, so we're in the north, and I simply say slew, it's going to give me my standard confirmation, and it's going to start its little journey. So I can see the mount moving now and tracking, going north or south, I should say, in this case, 
as we switch our orientation to south, we should see that mount indicator come in to where it thinks uh, Jupiter is now. And uh, once it reaches the destination, um, and that's, um, that's it. And now we're ready to start observing from there. So from startup to, uh, so, you know, in terms of connection, in terms of working with the planetarium program, quite quick to get from uh, zero to observing in this case. So that, um, by my count, took about 19 seconds to go from Polaris to Jupiter, which is going from the North Pole to the ecliptic um, right across the major part of the sky. So quite uh, acceptable, I think, slew speed there. And, um, and uh, that's uh, one of the nice things about it. So just at, if this mount was being sold without anything else, it would be a capable, nice, compact, portable mount by itself. Now, one of the other um, things that's really neat about this is that it also comes with free apps. So there's two apps that are kind of related here. One is called ASI Air and one is called ASI Mount. The ASI Mount app is just for mount control. So what it allows you to do is to basically have a small planetarium program. You go pick uh, a target, you point to that target, you push on the go to button and it goes to it. So it's kind of like your app for visual observing. I want to just go and do my Messier mar marathon and I want to get it, uh, knock it off really fast as Claudia was suggesting. So I can go and do that with that ASI mount app. Now the, the, the app that's more powerful and more intriguing for a lot of ways is the ASI Air app. So what this is, is it's a um, piece of hardware and you can see it on the, the side of the telescope here. I'll just uh, move that around so people can see it. Um, so this um, controller is a small box that's attached to the telescope, essentially. And that box contains a uh, microcomputer uh, of, uh, of various kinds, and it has a little Wi-Fi antenna attached to it. So you can see there that it's uh, essentially sitting on the side of the mount. It has an attachment point, and it lives there most of the time. And that app not only can manage and control the mount, but it can also manage and control your astrophotography session as well, which is kind of cool. Um, so we'll just take a quick look at what that app looks like when we're working with it with the telescope. I'm just going to give a quick uh, demo of how the AM5 mount works with the um, software that's provided by and works with the ASI Air mini computer app. So the ASI uh, 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 mini computer is essentially a small uh, Android uh, Linux box that runs uh, on the computer and is uh, controlled by the uh, app on the phone. So when we enter the device, um, the uh, app kicks, kicks in and connects through uh, the built-in Wi-Fi connection that it has. And that Wi-Fi connection uh, enables us in this overall uh, pattern here where we're able to see uh, the cameras that are set up here. So for example, we've got a Canon uh, DSLR here that's uh, configured, and I can enable that camera and uh, essentially uh, connect, connect it with my main scope here and you can see how I've set up my scope to have correct focal length so it knows how to plate solve with it uh, which is uh, which is nice um, and it has the ability to save the uh, save the, the settings I'm also able to work with a guide camera and this is in this case I'm using a, a ZWO guide camera so it's actually uh, native to it and it's able to work with that uh, uh, with uh, not calibration, but uh, guiding. Um, so the guide camera is built in. And then here we have the uh, AM5 mount again. So in this case, it's uh, you can see that it's uh, connected and then you're able to uh, choose what objects you would like to go to. So there's a built-in list of uh, favorable objects and it shows you roughly when you can expect them to be visible during the day. So currently, uh, if we look at the time of day, uh, we look for something like uh, an M31 we can see it's it's visible, so I can choose that object here, and it will uh, allow me to uh, focus on that object there. Um, <clears throat> and I can do uh, other settings here that are related to it. 
So if I leave that and I go to uh, uh, the go to controls here, I essentially all I have to do here is click on go and it will uh, activate the mount and send it off on its way to that target. So uh, one of the things that's nice about this is I don't necessarily have to have a computer in the field. All I need is a tablet or a phone and I can actually go ahead and do uh, the general setting. Now what it was trying to do there was it was trying to confirm its location by doing a uh, plate solving. So I'm gonna stop that for now, but, um, but this is actually a pretty, pretty cool feature. As long as you can find the object or enter it, um, you can work with it. And all of these controls are fairly intuitive. It takes a little bit of learning to get used to it, but essentially uh, the planetarium that's built in here I, I can see there's my target, there's some stars around it. So if I knew that my actual target was close to, uh, say, New Andromeda, then I would be able to go and pick New Andromeda, and then I would be able to go to that uh, that new target. And so I would move the telescope there. And again, it will try to center the object. So to do a plate solve in the area and try to center on that object knowing uh, what is built in. And again, I'm doing this with just a phone. So this is kind of cool new technology. Um, that I haven't certainly played with before, but uh, I think the the opportunity here is uh, is really kind of uh, interesting. You're able to do uh, full on photography sessions with this, and again, uh, you're storing either on the app or uh, on the on the phone that uh, you're using. Uh, so overall, it's been been a fascinating experience working with this software and uh, learning a lot. And what I really like about it is that we're able to compactify our uh, what we need to take out of the field to take uh, some of the decent astrophotos. And uh, this, this will really reduce the, uh, the time and effort that it requires to go and get uh, good uh, in the field. Back to our presentation. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate that. So um, we talked a little bit about photography there. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about these harmonic moments is that um, <clears throat> traditional mounts uh, were very concerned about periodic error and there's a thing called periodic error correction where you have a process that basically says we know that every 20 seconds or so this mount is going to go whoa and so we're going to do an anti whoa every 20 seconds and so that periodic error correction that that active uh, correction piece reduces the amount of guiding you have because the mount kind of already knows that it's guilty of about uh, making a mistake before it actually happens and so it actually corrects it actively. In this case, <clears throat> the there isn't really a periodic error. There's kind of some periodic error, but again, because of the nature of the gearing, what's really happening is it's got a very solid connection and any errors that is happening in the tracking is really much more related to the load and where that load is shifting. So as you're tracking across the night sky, even though it's tracking very slowly, you're actually kind of shifting the load. And I think, you know, when you when you sort of lean over too far, you feel the pressure and that's what's actually causing some of that error. So ZWO's answer to this is sort of saying, well, it's not really that we're not really in the business of doing periodic error correction because it's not really repeating. It doesn't repeat. It's sort of cyclical, but it doesn't repeat. But there are ideas that they make sure that the mount is shipped has got <clears throat> what I would call guaranteed manageable error. So in other words, with standard guiding applied to the mount in a photography session, they will be able to nail the errors and get round stars out of it. And they provide you with a lovely certificate of authenticity that comes with every mount. So every time you've spent $3,000, you too can get a piece of paper that tells you that. But the actual test report actually shows the full cycle of the entire circular process of it. And it shows <clears throat> uh, what those maximum errors are. So the idea again is that you can um, actually um, see that the actual maximum error is 20 arc seconds with a minimum periodic error of about eight arc seconds, which can be guided out. And they would expect you to guide out those errors as you go forward. Now, I think this is where the ioptron version of this is coming with their encoder version because with an encoder that actually accurately tracks time and motion you could uh, deal with that error uh, through a different approach but that's how it goes 
So just um, some caveats. So it's all what I've been saying so far is kind of like good news story, good news story, good news story. But beware of the walled garden, right? So um, the ASI Air app that I showed off, all very cool, all very nice. Um, the primary cameras it support are ZWO cameras, Nikon DSLRs, and Canon DSLRs, and that's it. All the other things, the guide camera, the focusers, the filter wheels, only support ZWO products. So that's a deliberate strategy, I'm sure, by the manufacturer. I happen to have a ZWO guide camera I bought a couple of years earlier. So I invested in the ASI Air box to go with this. Um, and the other thing I think is important to note is that this is the first ever foray of this camera company into the mount business, right? So we are getting essentially a nice, well-turned-out piece of kit that I think is good, but they are not like a Skywatcher or a Celestron who has been turning out many, 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 many mounts for many, many years. So um, and uh, so, and I'm sure that Celestron and Skywatcher and so forth are working on their own versions of harmonic-driven mounts that will probably be hitting the market soon. So there will probably be more uh, selection in this area in the future. So what's my verdict overall? I think um, lighter, smarter mount than I've ever had before. I, I like the build quality. It's solid. It's attractive. Um, it looks good. I really love the fact that the, the backlash is not there. I really love the fact that the plate solving is just built in. I have tried for, to do plate solving successfully for years. I've, it's been hit and miss for me. There's always something that goes wrong. I just powered this up in the field and I'll... Uh, and and essentially nailed the center of my my photo photographic subject was nailed in the center of the field of view the first time I tried. And I was like, wow, that's really good. Um, uh, price point, roughly around there. Um, there are no user serviceable parts in these drives. They literally say your warranty is toast if you open this box. And most people are saying, that, yeah, there's no adjustments to make. There's no lubrication. I'm cool with that, actually. I don't really want to um, worry about that so much, especially for this. And then um, the polar alignment is software-driven, uh, part of the uh, ASI Air dra uh, Drap. But you can see how the little mini computer is attached to the side of the scope. You could put a polar scope on that and, and then use some other uh, methods for polar alignment. And also it supports both the Lost Mandy and the Vixen standard uh, for the plate. So it will hold the Lost Mandy style uh, mount if you want. So things that happened on my first night with it. So the first thing I had was I had a lot of trouble getting the mount to start. Um, I found uh, that if you use the on button, uh, it works much better. The on button is that little red button there that which was hiding and it was very hard to see because it's a red button on a red thing. Now, once you know where it is, it's much, much better. Um, the object acquisition, I found it was really hard the first few times trying to uh, verify the pointing because every time I picked a target, there's a damn tree in the way. It's like, oh, I'll try that. But, you know, it's like I can see it from where I'm standing, but the telescope can't see it from where the telescope is standing. So it's like, oh, I can't find it because there's a tree in the way. But then I had, um, I, I picked a target and I did some photography on my first night out and, uh, and I did well. So this is the spindle galaxy. I don't know if you can see my little galaxy, but it's right there. So this is a fairly wide field of view, 600 millimeter wide field thing. And it's a, it's a barred spiral galaxy with a dust, big dust lane in the way, whoops. And what I was really pleased about was the tracking on this. So. Pretty well all of my stars, I'll, I'll defer to the astrophotographers in the audience, but I think all of my stars are pretty acceptably round in this picture. And um, uh, I've got a galaxy, um, you know, from, uh, on, uh, from there. And overall, um, I was, I, I, I told my wife I haven't had a, as successful uh, an observing night as I had had with this mount in quite a while. So I was, I was pretty pleased with it, even though it was a bit expensive. I mean, um, you know, it, 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 it delivered what it promised. And I think that's, that's the thing we like the most. So I'll leave it there and open it up the, the floor and the, the web for any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Dennis. Great review of the mount. Very interesting. 
new technology. Thank you again. Sure. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, questions in the room. Here we go. Let me pass you the microphone so the online audience can hear your question as well. Uh, sorry, I just have uh, basically two questions in one. Uh, the first, how much power draw does this uh, take? It's rated at five amps for, um, right. for the um, recommended load. It needs about three, but it has a power pass through that you can hook other devices to. And in this case, I'm passing through the power through the mount to drive the little ASI air box, which in turn is driving guide cameras and so on. Five amps is the number that they give. Yeah. And the second question is uh, what kind of a battery or power uh, management do you use for it? Right now I'm, um, I've been using the Celestron power tank um, but what I found is that if I'm not careful, the power tank will um, fail when I'm slewing on it. So it, what I found worked successfully was having um, uh, the mount on its own power supply, portable power supply, running, drawing about three amps mostly, and then having everything else on a second power supply. So I kind of need a two battery system or shore power. If I've got shore power, then then the adapter I have will will push five amps, no trouble. Great question, thank you. Yeah, that's that's quite a bit. If I remember correctly, my LX two hundred uh, me uses a two amp power supply, so it's quite a difference. Yeah, well, I think yeah. the mount will will be happy with with three, but um, mm -hmm. it, it asks for up to five. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any more questions in the room? If not, let's go online. Emma, any questions? Well, you did get a question coming in online from Eric Briggs, um, who wants to know, concerning camera companies venturing into mounts, we've seen telescope companies making astro camera ventures in the past, and the results are variable. What are your thoughts? Thanks, Eric. Um, I mean, just based on looking at this particular unit, the quality of the packaging, the nice case it came in, the, the the generally excellent performance when I've tried it in the field, it seems like they've got something that, that works here. Um, and I think by focusing on this harmonic drive mount, and maybe they'll come up with a, a little smaller one and a little bigger one, I think they would probably be successful if they stick, with, stick to this particular um, package, if you know what I mean. Uh, in other words, don't try to uh, expand too far into this market, but but build on the success of this mount. They seem to be pretty popular from what I can see, back ordered and uh, and so forth in the market. That's great. Uh, thank you. That's the only question we got from online. All right. Okay. So, thank you again, uh, Dennis, uh, especially for bringing over the equipment, setting it all up. Now you're going to have to tear it down. It's quite a bit I'll of just uh, I'll just I'll just send them out home now. <laughs> what? No. Nope. Uh oh. Oh. Ooh. There we go. Ah. See what I did there. All right. All right. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right.
Hello and good evening. So thank you very much to all our presenters and hello to everyone online and here in the room. So uh, let's get on with the announcements. So uh, we have two types of meetings here at this uh, online and at the Science Center. Um, our, what we've had tonight is one of our recreational astronomy nights uh, where we have uh, members of the society come up and talk about what they're doing or what they've been working on. And then in two weeks time, we will be having one of our speaker nights. Those are still online only. And um, if you're joining us uh, live on YouTube, please uh, say hello in the chat, um, enter some questions for the presenters. And if you're a new member, introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far outside of the Toronto area, please uh, let us know where you're coming from. So our next speaker's night is in two weeks. Uh, Parissa Nazari, a, a master science uh, candidate at Queen's University, will be discussing from dust grains to stars and shots in the dark. Uh, that'll be live on YouTube. Our next recreational astronomy night is uh, on the 5th of April at 7.30 p.m. Uh, online and live in person at the Science Center. Uh, Arnold Brody will be discussing the sky this month and we currently have two open slots. So um, if you'd like to present something, please let Paul Markov know. Uh, just so you know, there will be a Toronto Centre Council meeting on Wednesday, March the 8th, 7.30 p.m. Uh, it's online and members only. Um, if you're interested in listening in, uh, please contact me for details. Coming up to the DDO uh, in the next month on uh, March 3rd is a uh, Astronomy Speakers Night. Uh, Dr. Oh, I'm going to completely botch this, so I apologize in advance. Dr. Junwoo Huang will be discussing a camera for the dark universe. And then on Sunday, March 5th uh, is Planetarium Day with the main session at 2.30 to 4 p.m. with a additional session will be created before running from 1 to 2.30 p.m. if we fill the first one. So uh, first one is at 2.30, and if we need a second one, it'll come before that. So we've got a few things going on at the DDO for March break. Um, on Saturday, March 11th, uh, is Space Action, Craters, and Comets. Uh, Sun Fun is on Monday, March 13th. And DDA, and Out of This World, the solar system, is on March 16th. For all of these events, you'll have to register online. The links to these events can be found at raskto.ca. And then we wrap up the month with DDO, uh, at the DDO, uh, with Sunday sun gazing on March 26th. So unfortunately, uh, due to an impasse regarding roadside parking and quite a bit of snow, the CAO is closed until further notice. Um, it'll reopen when the road reopens. So that depends on how much more snow we get in the season. Fingers crossed that it's sometime in April. Uh, just a few requests uh, here. We're looking for some volunteers. Um, we're still trying to find an education and public outreach chair. We're still looking for a life pollution committee chair. And we're still hoping to find a volunteer committee chair and a marketing committee chair, as well as some committee members. The Education and Public Outreach Committee is always looking for online presenters as well as telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. Just a reminder that if you wish to volunteer, you must first be a member. Uh, please drop me a line at uh, president at rasto.ca if you'd like to help out. This is the part where I get to plug membership in the RASC. Um, you can renew or sign up uh, online at secure.rask.ca. Gift memberships are also available. Contact the national office at mempub at rask.ca for more details. To the folks that are here um, at the Science Center, I'd like to invite you to join us at the meeting after the meeting at the Granite Brew Pub in the southeast corner of uh, Eglinton Avenue East and Mount Pleasant. 
245 Eglinton Avenue East, if you want to plug that into your GPS or whichever form of navigation equipment that you're using these days. Um, free underground parking, access is off of Mount Pleasant Road, and we are usually in the back room. And for everyone uh, here and for everyone online, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant evening and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all the forms of social media we've got listed here. Uh, if you like what you saw on YouTube, please uh, like and subscribe, hit the notification bell. Uh, be safe and keep looking up. Good night, everybody. Thank you.